Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So one way to make a garden either more profitable or just cheaper if you're a home gardener is to do your own plant starts. However, it's also a great way to make farming and gardening way more expensive and time consuming if you do it wrong. How to start seeds the right way, especially on a budget, is what today's video will cover if you've been doing your own starts. This video may also give you some insight into what's been going wrong. So let's do it correctly. There are a few places we could start with this topic, but let's start with infrastructure basics because, well, it's kind of hard to grow a healthy plant without a dedicated growing space. And because I don't like to waste anyone's time, if you have a structure or an area already set up, you can skip to this time here to get more details on the actual production stuff. Trays, starter mix, beer pairings, planting depths, that sort of stuff. Okay, so for infrastructure, the space does not necessarily have to be overly complex or expensive or large, or in some drier, warmer climates, even fully covered. Conversely, some folks even grow all of their starts, some of their starts, or simply their microgreens entirely indoors. I should say here before we really get into this video that if you're looking for my advice on growing indoors, my advice is probably seek someone else's advice. I frankly do not do a ton of indoor growing under lights, at least no more than I absolutely have to, and I generally try to avoid advising people on stuff that I don't know that much about. Maybe a hydroponic grower in your area will have a better recommendation for you. So consult with them, start there, and scale up or down as necessary. I did this video here last year on a very basic greenhouse design, but essentially you need a relatively strong structure that can be enclosed in glass or plastic that has access to water and is in a reasonably sunny location. If the only place you have to locate said greenhouse is in a shady area, you may also have to consider adding a little supplemental lighting. So electricity access or solar power or a generator, I guess, may also be key. In fact, I like having access to electricity of some form for a number of reasons. For one, airflow, especially in the early spring when the greenhouse stays mostly closed, can be an issue. So I use a box fan to move this air around a bit. Uh, that will help prevent disease pressure on your plants. You can also get fancy and install vents and automatic fans and all sorts of gizmos, but you probably don't need a ton of that stuff on a small scale. A uh, box fan will do just fine for most of us. Uh, just keep in mind that beyond disease control, if a greenhouse can't be ventilated properly, it can easily cook or suffocate your plants, which I assume is not your goal. So if not using a fan or a vent, you will need to be able to open the doors and sides enough to allow air to pass through. Uh, the other reason I like having electricity available is heating. For years, I used a heat pad like this to boost the temperature for germination for plant starts, though now I'm trialing this heating cable, which I'm not entirely in love with yet, this particular brand, so I will do more trials and find a good one for you in the future because this one is not particularly great. The idea there being it's just a little cheaper to cover more ground with the heating cables. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of germination conditions also in a minute, but the idea here for infrastructure is that you need a good, warm, humid area to germinate most everything you'll want to grow. If the temperature fluctuates too much, that will slow the production down. If there's inadequate light, that too can limit production because the sun is literally where plants get their energy. Are there ways to do this without electricity? Sure, definitely. But things like rocket heaters or using compost to heat a greenhouse come with other complications. So make sure to really investigate those ideas before diving in fully because they can require a significant amount of management and thoughtful design. I also used barrels of water for many years to help moderate heat, but I suspect that coming out of the late winter, the barrels actually kept the greenhouse cooler in our climate. I didn't test that because I don't have two tunnels to compared to one another, weirdly, but it certainly seemed that way. And I had another grower, Lou Johns, who you will remember from the Living Pathway Roundtable we did recently. Also, he told me he tried a similar thing in New York and felt the barrels kept his house cooler for longer in the spring. So I have now dumped the water out of those barrels and I'm using them as kind of expensive tables. Yep. Speaking of tables, there are a million ways to do greenhouse tables from mesh to bottom watering sort of flats. Uh, I recommend starting with a simple structure that efficiently uses the space you have and won't fall or crumble under some weight because trays can get heavy when they get wet. So there's a lot of weight on them. Uh, on our four fifths of an acre of production, if we're not selling plant starts, this 450 square foot structure is mostly sufficient to fit all of our plant starts for the garden. 
So if you're looking to build one, maybe start with that as your baseline because 450 feet on four fifths of an acre is a good, that's a good round number to deal with. Also, I put old greenhouse plastic over the pallets. You know, I use the plastic so the roots aren't growing into the wood of the pallets, needlessly sort of exhausting the plants. So anyway, your growing area can look like a rack in a basement or a greenhouse like mine or a sunroom in your house or anything else, but the space you have access to and your budget will dictate a lot of that. And you can always upgrade. I mean, I tell myself every year that I'm gonna do that. It's good to have hope, I guess. Now, with the basic infrastructure out of the way, here's what you need to think about for the actual plants. First, in terms of the trays, there is no one right option. Some growers use cell trays, some wind strips, others like myself use a lot of soil blocks. Some professional growers also use paper pot transplanters. There are even biodegradable pots for smaller scales or plastic cups. I mean, throughout the ages, people have used all sorts of things to grow out seedlings. Uh, let me go through the pros and cons of some of the more accessible and popular options, starting with soil blocking, because I'm a big soil blocking nerd. First, soil blocks are about exactly what they sound like. They are blocks of soil that you can plant crops into, but they are not for everyone. A lot of professional growers do not use them because they are labor intensive and use double or triple the amount of soil mix. For me, I learned to grow food with soil blocks 15 years ago and have used them ever since. Uh, in my trials, they make healthier and larger starts than the average cell tray, and the crops do at least slightly better. And moreover, because soil blocks use more soil mix, I like to think of them as part of our fertility program. I can use less compost on a bed because I'm using so much more soil mix per crop. On the con side, they are indeed more labor intensive and heavier, and it's harder to carry, say, four trays of soil blocks than it is to carry four trays of cell trays at one time. On a commercial scale, I recommend the Swift blockers like this. Pausing here to let the B-roll do its thing. Or the standing blockers like these that are a little nicer on your back in terms of being able to stand straight up to use them, but a little harder on the shoulders and elbows and hands. On a gardening scale, hand blocker or two will do just fine. We use those for years and still bust them out for certain applications. As for cell trays, I can't stand the flimsy ones that many other great growers use with fear of sounding snobby about one method over another, which I loathe when I catch myself doing that, and I'm sorry when it happens. Uh, those flimsy cheap cell trays are just not my thing. I end up just wasting them and I hate fiddling with them. It's kind of hard to pop them, just not my thing. Instead, I prefer something a little bit more sturdy, like these, for instance, sent to me by our buddy Sean at All About the Garden, designed by Mr. Charles Dowding himself. Uh, they're super sturdy, easy and fast to load and easy to pop with a large hole at the bottom, big enough for a finger. For your average cell tray, you really need a popper to release the cells efficiently. So being able to do it with your fingers, kind of nice, especially on a garden scale. On the pro side, they are fast to load, uh, the cell trays, light, easy to carry around, and a space efficient. On the con side, cells are harder to keep hydrated. Uh, their transplant window is short, meaning once they're ready, you only have a few days before they will start to decline or become root bound. And to that last point, cell trays can become root bound when left too long, meaning that the roots will wrap around the soil block instead of growing large, healthy transplants. Now, there is also the option of wind strips, which offer the speed and efficiency of cell trays with the air pruning effect of soil blocks from these little slats on the sides of the wind strips. Air pruning just meaning that the roots will sense air and stop wrapping around the block so much and put its energy into growing a healthy plant. The biggest cons with wind strips is that they are not cheap. Uh, they are made in a way that will ensure they last, but it will be a sizable upfront cost. Uh, they are also a little harder to keep moist, like the blocks once you have them going with all that air around the bottom of the cells, but you won't get the roots growing into the other blocks like you do with soil blocks. Because paper pots are a more complicated option, I'm going to hold off on discussing them too much at the moment. What I will say is the paper pot system is something that requires not only great greenhouse management, but soil and bed preparation as well. As, and also efficient irrigation before it can really be worthy of investment. Now, the rules for germinating in paper pots are largely the same as germinating in anything, except that your window for planting is a little shorter, meaning you need to get them out much earlier than even cell trays. Uh, moreover, paper pots really require perfect germination and perfect soil prep. Otherwise, you will have gaps in your plantings and may end up with dry seedlings in the field. So I recommend nailing down your germination techniques before ever even considering paper pots. 
Hey, so I'm editing this and I realized I kind of missed an important point and it drives me nuts when I realized that. So uh, I came out in the cold to tell you that uh, one of the big reasons that people use cell trays or some of those like wind strips and that sort of stuff is that you can use faster seeders like drop seeders or vacuum seeders that is a little harder with soil blocks although the swift blocker potentially is going to make one of those but it makes it easier because all the blocks are more uniform than with the hand blocker or the standing blocker um and also i got a haircut it's relevant back to younger me uh anyway bef more on paper pots perhaps at another time for now let's move past trays and start talking soil mix or starter mix or potting soil, whatever you want to call it, but soil mix is the common term among growers. Uh, the type of soil mix you use is probably the most important element I will discuss today in terms of growing great starts. Yes, you can technically make your own potting mix, and as I've discussed in other videos, I did that for years, and then I tried a professionally made mix from a good composter, and I realized that I've been basically just wasting my time making my own mix. The quality is just not the same, not as consistent, not as long lasting, not even with my best mixes, including like vermicast and stuff, just did not do as well. Now I use Tilth Soil out of Cleveland, Ohio for my sprout soil mix, but there may be a composter closer to you that makes a great uh, mix as well. So a good soil mix is key, perhaps obviously good viable seed is a given. You gotta have good seed to have good germination using super old seeds or seeds not kept in ideal conditions can result in poor germination. We keep all of our seeds in our walk-in cooler, but temperature is less important than moisture fluctuations. You don't want your seed getting moist and then dry and then moist and then dry over and over. That will slowly wear it down. I like my seed storage like I like my dad jokes, dry and cool. What have I become? Now, every crop has its own individual needs in terms of germination, but you don't have to memorize them. Wherever you bought that seed should provide the germination details that you need, and in many cases, they are listed right on the seed packet itself. Not all seeds have the same needs. Some seeds need to be covered to germinate, and others, like celery, require some sunlight to germinate. Lettuce, when buried too deeply, will not germinate well, whereas a brassica seed, like kale or broccoli or whatever, germinates fine down to about a third of an inch or so. Uh, and lettuce won't germinate well above 73 degrees Fahrenheit or 23.8 degrees Celsius, so it's definitely good to pay attention to those little details when starting seeds. After I seed a crop, I usually cover everything but parsley and celery with a small amount of dry soil mix to help hold in moisture around the seed. Others may use uh, what's called vermiculite, which is a mineral that is extracted and then heated, thus becoming a nice light popcorn-y material, good for retaining moisture, which is important in germination. Just a little bit sprinkled over top of the seeds will do fine. Now, some growers will use a germination chamber to achieve perfect germination, which is great. Uh, they take an old freezer or some sort of sealed cabinet, uh, add a heating element like a light or a small heater, plus a pan of water for humidity and a thermostat. Uh, then they germinate all of their trays at the exact temperature that those seeds need. I have no issues with germ chambers and they may be a really good idea for paper pot systems in particular, where like I said, you absolutely need as close to 100% germination as you can get. Otherwise, you will have big gaps in the chain. That would be a big waste of time and money. For me, I get pretty dang close to 100% germination without a germ chamber by just using a heat pad and covering the crops with row cover to retain moisture. And I like that. I don't have to move the crops around quite as much or concern myself as much with getting them out of the you know uh, enclosed space because anytime you block out light, like in a germ chamber, or a stack of trays, you have to watch those crops vigilantly because as soon as you see germination at all, they need to be in sunlight so as not to get leggy. Once the crops have germinated, getting them onto a table and in full but not suppressive sunlight is key. That term, legginess, I mentioned, doesn't just happen in no light environments. If a seedling is not receiving sufficient light but it is receiving adequate heat and moisture, it will grow tall and lengthy, i.e. leggy, which could make it a weaker crop in the ground. A leggy lettuce, for instance, may still make a lettuce head, but with a weaker stem that may not be able to support the plant very well, which means that the plant will kind of lay on the ground and become susceptible to molds. Anyway, once the crop has effectively germinated, or at least you can see the germs starting, uh, get them separated on tables, and like I said, in as full of sunlight as you can, probably still in your greenhouse. 
Now, keeping the crops moist is just about diligence. Uh, with overhead watering, you just have to be careful around crops like tomatoes whose leaves can be susceptible to fungal diseases. It's not gonna affect soil blocks. You start out lightly before the plants germinate, and then as the plants start to grow, you don't have to worry about ruining your soil blocks with overhead watering. Bottom watering is also an option, especially you know to avoid spraying the leaves. Um, and depending on what trays you choose, there is a bottom watering option or you can build your own bottom watering table. Basically, you fill whatever tray you choose with enough water to saturate your seedlings instead of overhead watering and spraying the leaves, thus you know making them more susceptible to disease. Like I said, this is especially helpful with things like tomatoes and peppers, but also with microgreens, among other crops. They should not sit in a pool of water, though. They need enough water to stay moist to the touch, but not so much that the roots suffocate. I also like having a bottom watering tray option on hand to inoculate our trays with beneficial microbes, like with compost teas, extracts, etc., before they go into the field. That's the fastest way to inoculate a field that I've found because dragging around a heavy sprayer is, well, kind of a drag and it's slow. Anyway, if you choose a good compost mix, the shorter season crops like kale or lettuce or even broccoli should all be fine on fertility up until transplantation. For longer season stuff like tomatoes or peppers, or if you see yellowing in the greenhouse, I recommend having a little fish hydrolysate like these from Neptune's Harvest. There's a link in the show notes, save you 5%. On having those on hand to give them a nitrogen boost. This will keep them happy enough to get them to the field. Also, as longer season crops get bigger, you can pot or ball them up uh, to add a little bit more growing space for the roots and fertility for them to just keep munching on, keep them watered. Any drying out will slow down the whole growing process. Uh, check them by hand too, just you know, feel the block. I doubt I have any B-roll of this, but sometimes a slick cap of algae can belie the dryness of the soil block or cell block below it. So you'll get a little bit of algae on top. It's not a big deal, but it will sometimes keep the block from getting wet. So you gotta be mindful of that. Those may need bottom watering or extra watering. Last tidbit is just that as plants get bigger and more crowded, ventilation will become paramount. Keep the leaves as dry as possible and separate them a bit on trays where possible. Like if you have a bunch of tomatoes growing together, like separate out the tomatoes, pull the trays apart. You don't want a mass of tomatoes because you're just not getting any ventilation right to the middle. Yeah, and even spin the trays around to ensure that you're watering them evenly. Also, another thing that you're going to, did I just say the last thing was gonna be the last thing? Also, another thing you're going to see growers do before their plants go out into the fields is harden them off, which means that plants get taken out of the greenhouse and put in direct sunlight for a few days before going into the field. This will help toughen them up for the harsh real world that is the garden life. We usually harden crops off for a week or so, uh, though hardening off is less of a concern in soil blocks in our experience than in cell trays. And I don't exactly know why that is, though I suspect just the root establishment element that makes soil blocks better at getting started in the garden soil and not having being wrapped up or anything. For indoor grown plants, you will absolutely need this transition period, preferably in stages, like a little bit of light at a time, uh, because the transition from artificial light to sunlight can be harsh. Anyway, I have just talked for what feels like an hour, so I hope it was helpful. Heads up that if you'd like to see this farm, my farm, in person this spring of 2024, we just posted our field day events geared around specific topics over at roughdraftfarmstead.com. Hopefully those tickets are still available when I post this, otherwise I'm kind of a jerk. Uh, make sure to add your two cents or anything I missed in the comments section. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook to support our work or hat or other merch at notillgrowers.com. Become a Patreon member and get discounts on seeds and boots and all sorts of stuff at patreon.com slash notillgrowers. Paying $2 a month or $5 a month to get like save hundreds of dollars on seeds seems like a pretty sweet deal. Or just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. Woo, it's chilly. Farmer Jesse died by video.